Okay, so this is probably the most important debate during the whole thing, and there's been a lot of debates, a lot of great organizations that put them on. So, uh, anyone could screw this up, so we decided we're not going to handle this one. Uh, so we brought in a bringer. So our moderator this afternoon is director of the Center for Study of Local Issues at Anne Arundel Community College. Dr. Nataf is responsible for the semi-annual survey of local and statewide issues that have been produced by the college since 1978. And Dr. Nataf was with us on primary night. He was a, he was a great break from us yammering on because he brought an air of gravitas to it, which was fantastic. And as a bonus, he's a Ward 8 resident. So please give it up for Dr. Dan Nataf. Thank you, Dr. generous introduction uh, in case any of you are wondering when my next survey is coming out next week so keep attentive for that and you can find out all the good news as to who's up who's down what issues are salient which aren't all right today we'll be using the following format uh, we have about two hours for this debate the first yes two hours <laughs> the first part will be asking questions <clears throat> that we have prepared um, John and Tim have already said that we spent uh, many hours going over really hard questions. Um, each candidate will have three minutes uh, to address the question with a one minute uh, follow up by each uh, afterwards. And if they become vague, I'll try to hold their feet to the fire for another minute or so. The second part will include questions <clears throat> prepared by the audience. Since we, uh, let me get a little water here. Oh, wait, I have a picture that they think I drink pictures. Uh, <laughs> glass of water. Uh, oh, I thank you. They'll do anything for a photo. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, where were we? Okay, the second part will be will include questions prepared by you, the audience. Uh, we anticipate that there'll be more questions than we can possibly uh, go over so that candidates will draw from a pool of questions and they'll have a couple minutes to address each one. Uh, each candidate will start with a, uh, an opening uh, statement and then we'll close with a, a closing statement at the end. They'll have three minutes in each case. Uh, we did a coin flip and uh, the way it worked out to the mutual agreement of the candidates, uh, Gavin will go first in both cases and uh, Mike will go last in both cases. So we start then with you, uh, Gavin Buckley. Hello, how you doing? I was going to say I'm very nervous straight out of the gate, so this is new <laughs> for me. Um, I want to thank Mike uh, for uh, making me a better person. Uh, this is uh, something that I've never really uh, done before and I've learned so much through this process. So um, thank you, Mike. I want to thank you guys um, for coming out here because uh, without you there is nothing. So uh, I wanted a chance to work for you, to work for the citizens of this town. But I'm running, I'm not running against Mike and I, I wasn't running against John. I'm running for some new ideas and I'm running for change. And I believe that um, what I see happening is I see our city um, selling off assets. We sold off uh, the old rec center. I uh, see us. I, pretend, I fear that we might sell off the market house. We sold off the golf course, and um, we're privatizing things. And I believe that we're heading in a direction where we won't have a city left anymore. And so my kids go to school in this town. My kids go to Green Street and Annapolis Middle. Um, and I think we, need, we deserve better for those kids. So I want the kids to see a town that we are all proud of. So um, I'm here asking for your vote. I want to thank uh, these guys for putting this event on. I, I think it's amazing that citizens are this engaged and they want to come out. And I promise you I will be um, a good advocate for you. Thank you. Mike. It's been an honor serving as your mayor for the last four years. Being mayor of your hometown is a dream come true. With the time we have tonight, I want to share with you why I ran for office, what I've done as mayor, and more importantly, my vision for the future. I love this city. I'm a third, genera third generation Annapolitan, was born and raised here. I ran for mayor four years ago because I saw the city heading in the wrong direction, and I knew that I had the leadership skills to move us forward. When I first got elected, I wanted to focus on local issues, like improving our fire department. One of the first things I did was met with the fire chief, and he told me we want to be a class one fire department. In the state of Maryland, there's only two fire departments out of 157 that have this distinction, and Annapolis is one of them. 
That means everyone in the audience is eligible for reduction in their fire insurance rates. One of the main issues that got me elected was the budget. You know, before I was here, we had two rounds of massive tax increases. Water bills got doubled, trash got cut back to once a week, and the city was still so broke, we had to borrow money to meet payroll. I'm proud to stand here today, say working in a bipartisan fashion with the council. We've passed four budgets without raising the tax rate. We've lowered the trash bills by 46%, and we don't have to do short-term borrowing anymore. Another issue was development. Development was running unchecked, schools were overcrowded. So we worked together with the council, and we passed an adequate public facilities act. What that means is, if a school is overcrowded, you can hold up a development for six years. It's an important step. Both of my parents started out as teachers. My mom taught Spanish, my dad taught history at Annapolis High School. And I'm proud to say that what we're gonna do in the future is even better. We have a huge emphasis on stopping crime and fixing the heroin epidemic. We've added 10 new police officers in the last budget. We put more money for overtime. We installed security cameras, which by the way, have solved some of the crimes we have. We have to give our officers the best state-of-the-art technology. That's why we introduced the body camera program. We switched to a community policing models, getting officers out of the car and building trust in there. And the last issue I want to talk about, which may be one of the most important, is the environment. You know, I'm proud to have the endorsement of the nonpartisan League of Conservation Voters. They did that because of my record, putting a million dollars in the capital fund for stormwater management, stopping the original massive Crystal Spring plan, and building an Annapolis Renewable Energy Park. I'm excited for this debate today, and I look forward to sharing with you my plans and vision for the future. Thank you. All right, the first the subject we're going to tackle is transportation. What are the key traffic, parking, and transit challenges confronting both the downtown area as well as other areas such as Forest Drive and Outer West Street? What are your specific priorities should you be elected in November? We start with Gavin. We have a lot of parking in this town. It's just not on the water. So what we have to do is we have to condition people to get out of their cars at the top of Main Street, not at the bottom of Main Street. That's one of the issues. People come here, try to park on the water. When they don't get a parking space, they circle around. They cause gridlock, they block up the Eastport Bridge, they block up Gate 1, and then they burn more fossil fuel, and then we, we're gridlocked and we get a reputation as a town that has a traffic problem. I have initiatives to get people out of their cars at the top of Main Street. We have three empty garages that sit empty seven nights a week and all weekend long. The Gotts Garage, the Whitmore Garage, and both of those garage are not in the, garages are not in the current parking plan, and one of those garages is free. We need to use, utilize those assets. I have a plan to get people out of their cars and into trolleys that are free and that are funded by federal transit funds and that are run as a business and they get people out of their cars and they get people to different destinations in the city. They get people to gate one, a gate three of the Naval Academy. They get people to Maryland Ave, an area that needs traffic, that needs uh, people going to it. They get people to St. John's, a college that not enough people see when they come to this city. It's a jewel. Everybody should see it when they come to Annapolis. And then uh, this trolley is going to stop at Main Street and it's going to go up and down Main Street. And um, I have to work with the business community on how we're going to implement this. But it's a fun uh, trolley, it's part of the experience. And so we're going to, that's called the Crosstown Flyer. We have another trolley called the East West Flyer. That, that trolley will get people from the stadium um, to Main Street, to the bottom of Main Street and to the bottom of the Eastport Bridge. And what we need to be doing is getting people out of their cars. We keep <coughs> talking about traffic, but we're not trying to get people out of their cars as soon as possible. So just a, that's just one small idea I have. Um, but, How about outside downtown? Yeah. So, yeah, so um, we, we need a, for, for mobility, I talk about bike path connectivity. So I think if you look at cities like, uh, if you look at countries like Denmark, 50% of the population get to work on their bikes. No one will get on a bike in this town because we're afraid to lose our lives. So, but if we put money into that infrastructure, if we used up, um, uh, uh, if we used open space funds to build solid a uh, bike network around the city, that would create mobility. That would create assets for the city. If you do good bike paths in your city, there is an asset for the city. There are uh, um, 
uh, they're, they're a great thing that, that you can sell houses on. So we need to do bike paths because bike paths mobilise people. We need to connect the Poplar Trail all the way to the mall. That's the next, a way to get to a job. We need to be thinking about things like this because in 10 years, we shouldn't be thinking about building parking garages because we should be thinking about what's this city going to be like in 10 years. And hopefully, for our kids' sake, we are driving less cars. So I'm going to take a broad approach talking about transportation in this city. We've talked a lot about the downtown area, and I'll address that in a second. But I want to talk about the other area of transportation, and that's our bus routes, which a lot of people depend on. If I look in this room, I would assume most people came here in a car. That's not a choice for a lot of people in Annapolis. You know, when I first took office, one of the things I saw, we have to do better for our transportation system. I saw that our buses weren't working because there weren't bus shelters, and it broke my heart to see people standing in the rain. So when I came in, the bus shelters were taken down for two and a half years. I went in there and said, we're going to replace all the bus shelters, and I want it done in 30 days. I got it done in nine months, which is actually light speed when you're working in government. <laughs> but everybody got done. Then I reached out to the county executive, and I said, 42% of our bus routes aren't in the city of Annapolis. They're in Anne Arundel County, and we can't afford to keep running them. Could you help us? He said, absolutely. So we increased our funding to 250000 500 to 750000 then I saw that we're not getting enough people to Annapolis. So we worked with the state of Maryland, and for the first time, there's a state bus that runs from the Eastern Shore to Annapolis to Baltimore, and they brought back the old run that runs from Annapolis to Baltimore, connecting people with jobs. When it comes to the downtown area, we need more technology. I used to work for a software company, and I realized we have to update things. Over the last four years, you're now able to pay with parking with your cell phone. If you don't want to stand outside and wait for the circulator, there's an app, which I encourage everyone to download. You can find where it is in real time. We put electronic uh, fare boxes in our bus system, so we have to do more to go. I agree. I've never stood up here and said we're always going to have parking downtown. The plan to get parking off of downtown is when we rebuild the Hillman garage to go to a level higher and a level lower. If we can do that, we can get rid of all the cars down there, but we can't do it until then. If we just get rid of all the parking downtown, if we rip up a lane of Main Street to put a trolley and take away 150 parking spaces, it's going to kill all the businesses. We can't afford to do that. So the plan over the next four years is working together, finding more funds to make our transportation, transportation system even better, and connecting everyone. Thank you. light on the applause. I mean, you know, we want to hear more questions from all of you as well as us. So. All right, next topic, the city finances. Over the last uh, 11 years, the city's debt has increased from 70 to 160 million. Since 2012, debt service has doubled to 10 million annu annually. What do you feel is an acceptable level of debt? And how, how do you keep that an acceptable level and still address the large and pressing capital projects such as the Hillman Garage or downtown flood mitigation? Not only that, but what would you do to address the estimated $30 million shortage in the pension fund for our city employees? So this time we start with Mike. I'm glad we're discussing this issue tonight. I feel it's one of my strongest suits. As I mentioned in my opening dialogue, it's one of the reasons I got elected. How do we solve this pension problem? I can tell you that over the last four years, the city has doubled, doubled its contributions to the retirement pension fund and the employees have paid more. We realize you're not going to get a 7 and a half, 8, 10 percent return on investments. So you've seen that we're committed. The city stepped up to the plate. The employees have stepped up to the plate. We're going to continue to do that. In terms of debt service, there's a lot of misinformation that goes on about that issue. We have to do things in the city that weren't done. Take the bulkhead downtown at City Dock. If you looked at it on a low tide day, you could literally see metal rebar and no concrete. That shouldn't have happened under my administration. It should have happened a decade ago. But we did it, on schedule and a million dollars under budget. A water treatment plant was built in 1929. The Capitol reported part of it was held together with duct tape. That's a $40 million project. Somebody had to do it. It happened under my administration. Main Street's getting redone next year. Should have happened years ago, but we're the ones who are doing it. So when people talk about debt service, it's not that we're just racking up debt to do. Oh, racking up, there we go. Racking up debt to do things we want to do. These are serious things. We've demolished our public works facility and building a new one. We're going to rebuild Hillman Garage. And the key to that is getting additional funds. If you look at flood mitigation, you know, I was shocked when I came into office. I said, 
what are we going to do to fix the flooding downtown? And there really wasn't a concrete plan. So I reached out to Governor Hogan and said, can I have a million dollars to start this process? And he agreed. And we're working right now to figure out how we're going to fix flood mitigation downtown. Most of the water isn't coming up over the top. It's coming back up the storm drains. So we have a very detailed plan on how we're going to solve this issue. There's a lot of infrastructure issues in this city. I put more money into roads and sidewalks because kicking the can down the road doesn't work anymore. Our city can't do that. We have a 300 year old infrastructure and we're going to keep working harder. In terms of money, when people talk about bond ratings and debt, we've had two upgrades in our bonds. And I have to tell you, I've done a lot of interviews with the newspapers, the base. There is nothing harder than going in front of the bond rating agencies in New York because they rip you apart every way you could ever imagine. You're not doing this, 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 here's what you're doing good, and they upgraded us twice. So it's not my opinion that we're doing good, it's these rating agencies that are very difficult. But if I'm elected, we're going to keep moving forward, we're going to keep investing in the pension funds for our public safety employees who put their lives on the line every day. They made a commitment to us and we're going to honor that commitment to them. Thank you. I'll speak to this from a, from a business perspective. So. Um, I, um, as a small business owner, understand um, intimately um, what it's like to do business in this town. And so we need to be thinking about revenues, and we need to be thinking about ideas to raise revenue. On West Street, we were in an area where no one gave this area any chance. We turned that around, we created jobs, we filled vacant buildings, and we created a tax base through those business, through business ideas. So we need to be thinking about, I believe, as the mayor of this city, that I'm going to improve the quality of life, improve, improve um, improve the values of our homes, so we're going to get increased revenues from, from, from increased uh, assessments on our houses. I think we are missing a lot of opportunities to get grants. We need to be seeking out as many grants. I joke about, I'm going to have a team of grant writing ninjas, and they're going to help us un uh, find every possible grant so we can get things done. And then we have to be finding the right private public partners to get to, for this town. So we need to be thinking about things like what they've done in Newport. In Newport, um, four years ago, we, uh, the universe, University of Maryland um, uh, asked Annapolis to get into a contest with Newport. It was called Race to Resiliency. So in Newport, they have run away with this idea and we have just let it fail. They look at uh, tidal rise solutions as a business opportunity. So they take this idea, they create, uh, they create ten, uh, a portfolio of different projects, and then they look out to the private sector to get those uh, projects done and fund those projects. And so with that private money, with that private public partnership, you can get things done. We know nationally now we're going to be getting less and less money from Washington, D.C. We have to be imaginative on ways to raise revenue. We have to look at programs like we see in other cities. In Charleston, Joe Riley had the, um, had the confidence of the business community. He convinced them that if we increased, put a small percentage of tax on our sales tax, we could, um, we could raise revenue that way and we could use that revenue for other, for, for, uh, for big uh, projects. And so I believe that if we win the business community's trust and we tie something like that to a, a big capital project like a convention center, out by Park Place, and that we can tie also into a, a property tax decrease, our property taxes are ridiculous in this town. People are leaving the town and going to the county because they're getting less service and more tax. So we have to look at revenues. I'll be focusing on revenues. I'll be making the business community strong in this town. And I believe that we're going to solve a lot of problems with that. Candidates, candidates have a, a one minute rebuttal opportunity. I got our first question. Well, here we are in the second. So Mike, if you'd like to take one minute. Sure. Rebuttal. One of the things. Oh, okay. there we go. One of the things we talked about uh, from Mr. Buckley was grants. And I can tell you that in my administration, we've had a 40% increase in grants that we've gotten. But you're also accurate. We're getting less and less money from the government. So if we're getting less and less money, how are we going to keep increasing grants? And when we talked about, well, you know what? Everybody's assessments are going to go up and we're going to lower their taxes. That's contradictory. If your assessments go up, your taxes go up. So I think that's something we have to think about. But other than that, you know, I admire the work you've done um, on Western. I think it's been a good thing for the city. You're good? Oh, okay. Next question. This battery is about uh, economic development. It'll be two questions. Um, first one, 
What are the key factors stalling economic development, both downtown and the rest of Annapolis? How significant are permitting issues in that regard? Have these been adversely affected by the drop in staffing at planning and zoning since 2009? What are your key recommendations to ensure a healthy business climate for all parts of Annapolis? We start with Gavin. Um, so we all agree, whether you're a, a, a resident trying to get a deck put on the back of your house, whether you're a business owner trying to start a business in this town, and I've started several of them, um, or if you're a, a developer, you all think the system is broken. So we have a broken permit system. We have um, an unfriendly business environment in this town, and we have to turn that message around. So not to put all the blame on the city employees, but they, well, you have to take a long, hard a look at what's going on in the permit office. I believe our city employees are afraid to make a decision because they feel it will be politicised. We have to give them the tools to make the decisions so they can go ahead and do their job. So we have to create a business environment that's friendly. We have to give our staff the confidence to make decisions. We have to staff our positions. And then when we give them that confidence, we have to also ask them the question. We have to say, you are in the service business too. You know, you, we, you work for us. So when someone goes into a permit office, you should be trying to help them. We have this us versus them thing happening on. This line gets drawn in the sand. So many people say they don't want to do business in this town because of the permitting process. So we have to reverse that. So I'm planning on creating an office where you actually do a one-stop shop for a permit. And it'll be one of those vacancies that we can fill on Main Street. And there's programs out there. I'm not saying I'm an expert on this, but I've seen programs in San Diego and other cities in the country where they do a one-stop permit kind of process. And I think that we need to do that because that permit office, and I joke about there being a conference table in the window, and above that conference table there's a 90-day uh, counter. So at the very least, when the public walk by, they can see people with their heads in their hands. <laughs> um, and, that, and so people realise that these people have been in this office this long waiting for a permit. It takes years and years to get things done in this town. It shouldn't be like that. And as we wait years and years for things to happen, if it's a, a no answer or a yes answer, we should just make the decision. But if we, you know, if we, if we just sit around and we don't do anything and, the, and no, no development happens here, and we need thoughtful development, we need the right kind of development that gets things done for us. But if we sit around and do nothing, and then we see the whole perimeter of our city get built up, then we're going to get all the negative effects and none of the positive effects. When you look at city departments, when you think about what are the most important departments, police and fire come to mind. But when you look at politically and the day-to-day -day lifestyle, planning and zoning is probably one of the biggest departments that has an impact on your quality of life. So I just want to share with you a couple of things we've done and what we're going to do in the future. I agree with Gavin. I think if you ask anybody going 50 years back, getting a permit in the city has always been an issue. And it comes down to two things, people and process. What we can do for the employees is empower them, give them motivation and confidence that we're going to support them when they make a decision. The other thing we can do is process. And that's what we've done to start to clear up. Before I was mayor, there was two departments. There was planning and zoning and um, neighborhood environmental programs, really inspection and permits. We combine those to make it more efficient so governments would talk to each other. We had a major reorganization within that. But when it comes to things taking a while, I think there's times where it should take a while. If you talk about the formal Crystal Spring project, if you talk about the Eastport landing, I don't think we should fast track these things. I think we should have a firm approach on how we deal with it. But for the average person coming in, we did a couple things to make it easier. It used to be if you had a, a permit on your house, you would always have to get it for everything, replacing one window, replacing 10. You put a $500 threshold. If you're getting something less than $500 for the average person, you don't need a permit anymore. We change it from there to use. So if you're doing plumbing or, plumbing or electric, yes, you need a permit. But if you're just changing your floor tiles or carpet and it's $3,000, you don't need a permit anymore. So I understand that issue. We're gonna keep working forward to make it more efficient. We're gonna to try to utilize technology, giving people you know, when I worked in the private sector and I had a thing called Salesforce, and every day it would pop up what I had to do, when I had to do it, and my boss and I saw what my deadlines were. So I want to use technology to stay on top of people to make them do things more efficiently. There's a lot of work to do, but I'm confident that we're going to get through it in the future. Thank you.
like to add anything? I just want to ask Mike if he's trying to get a permit lately. <laughs> nobody thinks it's uh, it's better. And so yeah. it's nothing against Mike, it's nothing against the City Council, but it doesn't feel better. Stand at the top of Main Street and, and look down and tell me, does it feel any different? Go into the permit office and try to get a permit. It feels, it probably feels worse. And then also stand in Robinwood and look at all the board at houses. It does not feel better. Well, uh, this has briefly gotten mentioned in, in the question that I'm about to pose. What are the, there are two major and controversial developments attempting to build within the city, Providence Point and Lofts at Eastport Landing. Both have languished uh, within city bureaucracy and red tape. For those two specific developments, what is your ideal outcome? And there we start with Mike. Thank you. When we look at the last election, it was really about two major development issues in this city. I won with 59 votes out of 8,000, and I'm humbled by that. I know I didn't win in the landslide, and I realized the two issues is what happened at the old Fawcett's building downtown and what was going to happen at Crystal Spring. We have to go back and remember the history. My opponent wanted this development to happen. I was against it, and I stood here today. People said I haven't stopped it. If I was an elected mayor, they would be out there right now chopping down trees and building houses. And that's a fact. What was Crystal Spring? We have to remember, it was a massive commercial and residential development. We had commercial development the size of the Harbor Center, almost 200 townhouses, a West Marine, a Wegmans, and in this huge thing that would have overcrowded our schools, damaged our environment, and clogged up traffic. After rounds and rounds of rejection from city government, the developers packed up their bags and went back to Connecticut. Crystal Spring, as we know it, will never be built, and that's a fact. So what happened now? Providence Point, a group of people, the Lutherans, that wanted to build a senior living facility, came back and said, we would like to build just that piece on the property. And while I think everyone agrees that's much better than what was originally planned, it's still too big, it's still going to jam up our roads, and it's still going to cut down too many trees. So I'm not the person up here saying we're never going to build anything. On 170 acres, you have property rights, but we're going to make sure we do it right. Because there's always time to do the job over, and there's never time to do the job right. And this is an issue that affects us for legacy. You know, we talk about budgets and taxes. You can spend more for recreation, spend less, raise taxes, lower taxes. Once you let something of that size go through, there's no going back. There's no going back on it. For the Fawcett's building, they wanted to put this three-story monstrosity that was going forward. The day I got elected, and this is why elections matter, the developer pulled out. He wrote in the paper, Mark Wardan, he said, the mayor's elected, I'm not doing it. So do we let that sit empty forever, just a vacant piece of property? No. We did the opposite. We worked together with the community. I remember sitting through numerous public hearings, sitting in people's houses talking about it, and now we've got something that's going to be great for this city. It's keeping our maritime use. The boat shows are going in there. The Boston Whaler dealership in Northdale, and they're going to have a restaurant with rooftop and outside dining. Because if you live in Annapolis and you're not a member of a yacht club or the fleet reserves, you can't really eat on the water. It's going to be wonderful. On the Eastport Shopping Center, and I see my time is running out real quickly, everybody wants something to happen there. Everybody wants to see that shopping center redeveloped. We just have to make sure we do it right. There was ambiguity in the code. There's a lot of things that we can make better. And I promise and guarantee you, we will make it better and we'll clear that up in the code. Thank you. Uh, so on the Eastport Shopping Centre, um, the way we've done development in uh, West Street is uh, we get people around the table, we bring all the people in, the Diane Butlers, I know you're out there somewhere, <laughs> um, and, and the people from both sides of the aisle, and we get people around the table and we talk about how to get it done. And uh, there's a couple of developments that are coming to West Street um, soon and they are unopposed development. They have support letters from the President's Hill Residents Association. They've been taught, brought to the Ward 1 Residents Association and, and, and had good, good support in those areas. So we bring things to the people first and we get people around the table. We need to get people around the table on Eastport Landing. People in Eastport are not unreasonable. They want that project to be done in some form or another. But obviously the density is too much for these guys, for, for people on one side of the issue. So I say you can get people around the table and you can meet in the middle and reduce the bulk of that project. And while we're doing that, we should be looking at things like um, a parking station. 
at this point in time, when developers come to you and ask for things, you should create things, uh, amenities that we need as a city. So we should leverage those relationships at that point when developers need, um, you know, need their permits. So we could have a parking station there, and we could have a trolley or uh, some kind of thing that gets people in and out of the peninsula of Eastport and stops so much traffic going in there because it is crazy. If any of you guys have been down 4th Street lately, it's like a super hot project that doesn't mean it's stopped. Right? So, so, something's going to happen there, but what should happen is what the citizens want. We should be doing the most environmentally sensitive thing that we can do on that side. I'm sure Mike's going to walk towards that, but we should be thinking about things, and I think my version of Crystal Springs would be something that the citizens can handle, something that doesn't impact our, life, our, our quality of life, something that is adheres to the comprehensive plan. And in a dream world, I would make that developer create a bike path across um, Forest Drive. And that bike path could get us across Forest Drive, could get us to the middle Annapolis Middle School where my kid goes to school. It could also get us to the back of Quiet Waters Park. And it could also get people from Hunt Meadow into the historic district safely if we created a good shoulder on Spa Road. And if they do an assisted living, it could get a high-speed wheelchair across there. <laughs> Real quick on that. Um, I think it's a false narrative to say Crystal Springs wasn't stopped because you had a plan that was a massive development. That partnership dissolved and they went back. And in terms of the property, you know, you make a lot of friends in this business. You help a lot of people, which is the best part of being mayor. People come forward and they say, You've helped me with so many things. But you also make a lot of enemies. And I've made a lot of enemies, mainly on my stance on development. When you top, stop a $200 million project, they don't want you to win again. And you can look at the finance reports, but the person that owns that property donated the Gavin's campaign. I guarantee they haven't donated the mine. Do you want to tell us why you received some money from Absolutely, yeah. I know the Richardsons, they've been coming to Lemongrass for a long, long time. So if someone wants to donate to the campaign, she can donate to the campaign. She is not a bad person. She's a she has property rights. She she we we should stop vilifying her. And so I'm proud to say that she donated my campaign. That's okay. Yeah. That's a lot. All right. Okay. Let's move to crime. Crime such as the growing drug crisis and gang violence will be the top of a, of a list of concerns for many people. And Annapolis is no different. Crime is, in our city is generally concentrated in specific areas, most being in and around public housing. What specific steps would you take to reduce crime in Annapolis while keeping citizens informed of your efforts and while, without making the residents of public housing feel that they are being singled out as the cause? Here we start with you. So this is a, this, um, uh, an issue that really matters to me. My mom uh, lives in public housing in Australia. You can get um, public housing right and you can look around this city at Bloomsbury Square, Annapolis Gardens and see attempts to get it right and we've done it pretty well in those places. The reason we have problems um, is because they happen in neighbourhoods where people think they've been forgotten. So we have to start caring about people. We have to find investment to turn public housing around and we have great opportunities here. I see public housing as a great opportunity but you have to invest in it. If people think you don't care about them, they won't care. So I've been to uh, Baltimore in the last six months to a project called Uplands. It was a development that was, um, um, they took about 100 acres of section, uh, blighted Section 8. They knocked it down, they found the right private public partner. They rebuilt it, they rebuilt it with community centers and bike tracks and landscaping. They had Section 8 rentals, but they also had um, places you could buy. They had places for 100,000, 120,000, and they topped out at 220,000. And so, and then they had training for people, mortgage training, they had programs for people to get in there and start to achieve the dream. Because you know the rents that some people pay, if you go to Woodside Gardens, you know what Woodside Gardens rent is now? It's $1,800 a month. That's, that's not a cheap rent. And with that you get hot and cold running gunfire. It is not, I mean, there's no amenities, that's what you pay in a place that gets the ball. So we need, 
to fix these things. We need to make that our highest priority. I'm happy with Mike's appointment at Beverly on the, uh, uh, as the director of Hacker. I think she cares about it. She thinks that we could set the gold standard in public housing in this town if she's allowed to stay. So I think that um, we should lead the way. We did some of the first public housing in the whole country in this town, and we should be leaders with the state capital. So the question was to crime in the city of Annapolis and the public housing community. So let me start with the public housing community in Annapolis. One of the things I realized early on is they felt left out. They felt like nobody cared because nobody showed up and nobody had talked to them or engaged them in the process. So one of the first things I did for my transition team, they said, you have to inspect all the units. Why does one group get one quality of life and the other people are forgotten? We can't keep turning a blind eye to them. So we went in there and we inspected every single unit of public housing. And I have to tell you, there was a lot of fear going on. People were going door to door. The mayor's going to kick everyone out. He's here to gentrify the city. Not one person was kicked out. In fact, people thanked me for coming by. We knocked on their doors. We showed them we cared. And I have a folder this thick of all the inspections that took place and all the things we did. Most of our crime does occur in and around public housing. That's why 80% of our employments are there. When you look at East Fort Terrace Harbor House, there's two officers there almost all the time. And we had to switch our model of engaging the community. So we started a community policing initiative. And there's 16 of them right now. Officers getting out of their cars, talking to people, building trust within the community. Coffee with a cop. You've seen we've had six national nights out. We're doing more and more to deal with it. We talked earlier. We hired 10 new officers. We put money for overtime, more money for cameras. And we're going to keep doing that in the future. There was a sense that people weren't feeling the connection. They asked for body cameras. We've implemented body cameras. You know, one of the things I'm proud of is I don't have all the ideas. And most of my best ones don't come from me. They come from my open door session where people tell me, we're going to evolve, we're going to innovate, and we're going to keep doing things differently. The biggest thing we have to do is tackle the heroin problem. And I'd like to share with you some of the work I've done on that. The governor appointed me to the Opioid Intervention Task Force, which was eye-opening. The old model of we'll just lock people up doesn't work anymore. What do we do to get them a better education? What do we do once they get out of prison? What do we do for their health care? How do we get them a job? You know, one of the programs I launched was a second chance job fair. So many people can't find the job once they have a criminal record. So what did we do? We brought back a project that the city did 10 years ago. We gave people a second chance in our public works department. We teamed up with 10 private sector employees that were willing to give people another chance. 130 people came by. And those are some of the innovative things we're doing to get around it. We're going to make sure we get the drugs off the streets and lock the criminals up because public safety is the number one priority. It always has been and always will be. Thank you. You know, I believe um, in less militarization and, and more humanization. And so I think that people need to get to know their cops on a different level. We did a little initiative a little while ago um, called a color run, and we, uh, we ran a five kilometer race through Murray Hill, through Homewood, uh, past the police station, uh, down Taylor and then down Clay Street and the finish line was on Clay Street and the idea was to get people to see cops outside of their uniforms, to meet cops on a different level. So I would try to initiate things that give cops a couple of hours a week to actually coach a sport team, be in a homework program, so that cops can build those relationships. We should incentivize development to come to this town that actually creates housing for police, fire, nurses, we can incentivize development that way. Because if you're a cop and your kids go to the school, you're going to care about this place a lot more than if you just bust in and out. So. All right. Next question sort of sticks to the same theme, uh, focuses on uh, the housing authority. Public housing by design should be transitional housing, a temporary living situation until a permanent solution is found. Unfortunately, that model no longer exists and public housing has become a long-term solution. Vacancies are rare. Waiting lists are typically two years or longer. Do you think that in light of the churning of board members, weak finances, and possible, possible misuse of finances, HACA is in a position to tackle such problems? What would you suggest that HACA do to increase turnover and assist residents in developing plans to eventually transition out of public housing? So there we start with Mike. 
Thank you. One of the legacies I wanted to leave behind was try to transform the Housing Authority to make things different. And one of the first things I did was appoint new board members. And I think if you look at the board that I've appointed, it's probably better than any board we've ever had. And I brought people in with specific interests, um, expertise in certain areas, whether it was public safety, financing, how the housing authorities work in other areas, and they started to transform that. The first thing we had to do was figure out how bad we were, get an audit of what was going on. You know, when they came into office, they were dealt a bad hand. And they've done a lot of work in the future, and I think we have to give them credit for the work they've done. They've got a long road ahead of them, but they're on the right path. I think when you look at the RAD program, bringing in private money to help redevelop these, when you look at the Ross Grant self-sufficiency programs to help people transition out of it, that's the model to go to. But the first thing is getting to show up. As I said, knocking on their doors, talking to people, asking them what they need, trying to improve their quality of life. We can't keep vilifying public housing. You know, 99% of the people are good that live in public housing. Most of the people work. That's a common misconception. People don't work. So we have to do more for job fairs and opportunities. Not just a second chance program, but we built the energy park in Annapolis. We've reached out to them for a job fair. We reached out for one when we did with Maryland Live Casino. We have to keep giving them jobs and opportunity. That's the key. Once someone has a job, it takes care of so many of their problems. It takes care of their insurance, it takes care of their financial situation, their housing problem. You know, half of all divorces are because of financial reasons. We have to do more for jobs and economic opportunity in this city. And that's what I'm going to do to keep moving forward. I'm going to work with the board. I'm going to work with the residents. We have a debate coming up there. I'm going to knock on their doors. I'm going to be the mayor for everyone in Annapolis. And just going back to the comment I made earlier about inspecting the units, it was a lesson my grandparents taught me. You know, literally right next door to this building, my grandparents had their royal restaurant. It was the first restaurant in the city of Annapolis to desegregate. And why did they do it? Because it was popular? Because everyone applauded them on the back? Quite the opposite. They got tons of blowback from it. But it was the right thing to do. So when I saw the city's attitude is, well, they live in public housing. We don't need to inspect their units. I didn't believe that. I, I completely tore down that and said, we're going to inspect it. We've improved their quality of life. So I'm the mayor of everyone in Annapolis. I try to be the bipartisan mayor. And I want to lead this city forward over the next four years. It's been an honor to serve. And if you give me another chance, I'll keep moving forward, making positive progress. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that assessment, um, Dan, that um, it's just transitional. Because if you go into public housing, like I've been doing a lot for the campaign, and I've been door knocking and doing cookouts in all these areas, there are people there with disabilities, there are seniors, they are not going to graduate to a job. They are not going to find another alternative. And this model that's been used where we let it deteriorate for as long as possible and, th and then think that if it deteriorates and gets bad enough, somebody's going to leave. They're not going to leave because people are there because they have to be there. So what we have to do is we have to make it desirable. It, the, the, the great thing is there's not that many units. I know manageable number. We just have to come up with a plan and we have to win people's trust. So if you can win people's trust that you are going to do the right thing by them, that you are not going to eradicate public housing, and this is what people are fear. These are the people. This is what people are telling me when I knock on their doors. They're like, we fear that this board is getting stacked and that this public housing is going to be sold off. So one thing for sure, under my term, we will not be cutting deals that are 51% to the developer and 49% to the residents. The residents have to be the priority. We can make. We can get creative on public housing. When the Y was looking at. Um, Buying the rec center, I was completely against that idea, but I love it that the Y thought there was a market here. So why couldn't we get the Y to create a community center in the middle of public housing? Because that would be a lifestyle center that would be accessible to everything. One of my favorite things to do in this town is run around the track or walk around the track at Bates. Because you walk around that track, it's Latino families, it's African American families, it's white families, it's rich families and poor families. And we need to be creating places like that that are desirable. I would just say one thing about the fear that's going on out there. There is a lot of fear that people are going to shut down public housing. And we need to stop that fear. We need to stop that type of campaigning that says the mayor's coming in and is going to shut down all public housing. Because I'm not. It wasn't an easy thing. Believe me, I didn't score any political points for doing this, helping people in public housing. So I have a passion for it. I'm not here to throw people out. I'm here to make their quality of life better.
Um, now we'll move to something about other awards. It is safe to say that much, much of the attention of our city's elected officials and appointees is focused on issues facing Ward 1 and 8, downtown in particular. When, what issues do you see facing the other wards that need particular attention, and what would you do about it? Site-specific examples. We start with Gavin on this. So um, we need to uh, bring um, economic vitality to all parts of the city. So I have um, some ideas for different regions, but definitely, I think our biggest focus is um, in, in marginalised communities. So I think that you know the best solution to crime is a job. So what, what's happening here is kids are growing up with uh, thinking they don't have any hope, that they don't have any opportunity, that they can't get a job. We have to reverse that. We have to make them believe that there is opportunity. So I think that when we find the private-public partners for these redevelopments of, of public housing, we need to make sure that we create, you know, uh, apprenticeship programs or, or job training programs, things that are relevant that get the kids out and give the kids skills. So I think in those um, areas of public housing and the areas that we have, um, um, we need to be looking at ideas for jobs. In economic ideas, I think that on, say, Forest Drive, we should be putting some of the onus on infrastructure, on the developments that are happening. One of the things I want to do on Forest Drive is I want to get a big, um, a very wide bike path on the right-hand side of Forest Drive. I know it's a county road, but we should work with the county to do this. And that bike path could um, uh, uh, could get people to jobs, could slow people down, could get them to diff different um, um, uh, commercial centres. When I go around the city and I look at uh, Western Annapolis, the, uh, the connector idea I have is an idea to get people to that commercial centre. Western Annapolis could be connected to the Poplar Trail and out to the B&A Trail, and that should be something you do when you go around this city. On Maryland Ave, I spent some time on Maryland Ave, I see some great talks. I have some great ideas for Maryland Ave to re-energise that part of the city, even though it's in Ward 1. But we could do things like, um, uh, we need to close the street off, we need to get another restaurant on the other end of Maryland Ave to bookend it. We should close it off on Friday and Saturday nights and make it pedestrian only. We can, uh, if we can work with it. We could work with some of the property owners that own the property down the street. We could get some heading parking uh, thing. I've got a lot of different ideas on commercial stuff. In Eastport, um, I think that we should do a thing called the 4th Street Ferry. We should go from the, the Sailing Hall of Fame to 4th Street on the weekend, on the half an hour. We can get transit funds for that, and that would just be a reason for people to go across. One of the things that happens to me when I, people come in from another country here, I take them to Eastport for the Annapolis experience. We need to be making that Annapolis experience about our downtown. And so I've already come back to downtown, but um, it all comes back to the market house, fixing that, sorry. <laughs> so the question was on other awards, correct? All right. So I'll tell you a couple of things we're doing. You know, we have eight awards in the city of Annapolis. Some of them we call the forgotten awards, Ward 6, Ward 7, Ward 5 on the outskirts. We need to connect these wards and connect people to them. We have a vibrant maritime industry in this city. Over 3,000 people are employed. So when we talk about giving people jobs, we have to connect them with people in Ward 7. You know, when I talked to them, we had a maritime summit. Over 100 businesses came by. You know what their number one problem is? They can't find work. They can't find labor. They said we got over 100, 200 jobs we could fill tomorrow if people were trained. So connecting with people. Do you know where Ward 7 is? Can you connect them in that way? The other thing we have to do is on the environmental front, keep partnering with different communities and different environmental groups. You know, we have the first stormwater project between the city of Annapolis and the Housing Authority, and the first one between the city and Anne Arundel County, partnering people with all these, all these environmental programs, teaming up with neighborhoods and nonprofits like St. Luke's and these other churches that are going forward, using our money to help go out. In addition to that, revitalization is key. I think the biggest area for redevelopment is in Ward 3. Upper West Streeters are coming out of town. There's so many things we can do to make that better. You know, we just completed the Upper West Street study, which gives us key indicators on how we're going to do that. Part of it's just showing up. You know, people always say knowledge is power. Half of it's just hearing from people. So as I do as mayor, I go around the different community associations and I talk with people. What would you like to have happen? One of them was in Weems Creek in War II. They said there's all these derelict boats on the county. People are drinking and smoking and having parties all hours of the night. So we work with Anne Arundel County. And we basically gave our harbor master the ability to enforce on that waterfront, cleaning up the waterways. I had Ward 3, Alderman Ronald Pendell Charles Ward. 
We went over there and I brought every single department head to their meetings twice. Why did I do that? I wanted to show that we cared about the community. We're not just focused on Ward 1 in the downtown, that we're going to reach out to everybody else. So if you look at what I've done over the last four years, I don't have time to get into it now. I have specific things I've done in every ward, and I look forward to continuing that partnership in the future, because I'm the bipartisan mayor for all of Annapolis. Thank you. to uh, fill out your questions. I think we'll have a good amount of time. Uh, John uh, is the man who will pick them up. I said you got them in the back too. Okay, so uh, again, if you anything's been inspiring to you, you want to know more, or, or ask a specific question to a candidate, this is a good time to get your thoughts together and write it down. All right, uh, the next question uh, is, um, really about promises kept and, uh, and looking forward to the future. So it's a uh, two-parter. I think what I'll do is uh, I'll ask it first to Mike, and um, and then we'll have Gavin be able to say whatever he likes uh, after Mike has spoken. And then I'll ask Gavin a question and Mike can rebut. So first, to Mike, uh, in 2013, you campaigned on stopping Crystal Spring, reducing water rates, opposing zoning changes to 110 compromise, solving the city dock master, shelving, sorry, the city dock master plan, shoring up pensions, ending tax and fee increases, and making employees responsible for good service. Um, how do you think you've done? I'm gonna have to ask you to repeat that list halfway. <laughs> Let me hit it from the top. So I think we already talked about Crystal Spring. As we said, the original plan will never be built. The recent plans have been rejected going forward. Um, on the pension front, we talked about it. We have to invest in our pension fund so it doesn't get underfunded. Under my administration, we've doubled what we're putting towards that, and the city employees have paid more as well. What were some of the other ones? Uh, water rates. Zoning, sure. Uh, compromise Street, shoving City Dock Master Plan. What you tell so, me? So I think on the City Dock Master Plan, for the most part, we have, but there's specific yeah. things we haven't done. Uh, one of them was a cultural resource mitigation study. How are we going to protect our historic buildings in the future? There was a number of studies in that master plan that are important. Now you look at the Fawcett's building. You know they're raising that up about 20 inches wide because you have to think of new innovative ways to fix it. When it comes to water bills, I can tell you this. Every vote, and I'm sure someone's going to fact check this, but every vote that I can remember on the city council, there was only one vote that was all Democrats versus all the Republicans, and that was on lowering the water bills. And so why that happened, I don't know. I'm going to continue to fight. And even though I couldn't lower your water bills, which is that everybody knows has water, trash, refuse, stormwater fee, I said, let me lower the trash bills to help offset it. And we've lowered the trash bills by 46%. A couple of other ones? Well, why don't you tell us about what, what you've done to make employees responsible for good service? That's kind of the last part of that question. Employees responsible for good service? Sure. I think one thing is we try to motivate some of our employees. And I hold the department heads to a high standard. I walk around the town. You know, one time I walked from my house in Hunt Meadow all the way to um, actually City Hall. And I caught a number of things. If it was a bus shelter where the trash was overflowing, if somebody just left the mattress on the side of the road, I would walk around town. And I was holding them accountable saying, we have to do better, right? If there was a parking problem going on downtown and I snap a photo, it says, how come there's only one person working there to get people out? So I think I'm a hands-on mayor. I try to be out of the office as much as I can. I learned early on, you, you know, you can't be the man of the high castle that sits behind a desk all day. You gotta be around people. I think technology is another area we can work on to help keep people in terms of tasks. My office does it. You know, we go through every week and say, what were the complaints that came in? Did we solve them? I think particularly in inspection and permits, we can have a better fast tracking system to hold them accountable. You haven't done it, why haven't you done it, and when are we gonna fix it? Thank you. Uh, how will you improve? So um, I, I think the city dock um, master plan and the uh, replacement of the lockhead is a great example of what we do in this city. We do just enough to get by. So I spent uh, a little while um, ago, I spent a day with a mayor from Frederick. He took you around that town and he'd take you to a restaurant and say, see this ceiling here? I, I helped them put that up. He'd take you to their theatre and see the gold braid around this theatre. I stood on a ladder and I painted that. And then he'll take you to their river walk. And if any of you have been to the Frederick River Walk, it is beautiful. It has waterfalls. It has little um, uh, fountains. It has bridges with art. That man will stand there and he'll point to a flatbed and say, 
on that flower bed there'll be a thousand daffodils will come up in that next next month you know and so he cared about those details we did just enough we poured concrete on the city bulkhead smoothed it over lost a couple of feet on either side of ego alley and then we said okay look at us we did a great job we saved a million dollars i want you to spend that million dollars mike spend that million dollars on backflow preventers and spend that million dollars on on, on pumps just for that one low point, just for that one low point, people from the boat show are reaching out to me and sending me pictures now and saying, we have never seen the water this high at boat show. So we should have spent that million dollars and we could have used that first storm drain as a test case for us. On the City Dock Master Plan, I say this all the time, I want a park, not a parking lot. So, so, And the way we pay for it, what we do is, first of all, we cut the deal with the Green Street parking lot, with the Green Street, and that should be excess parking over there. And then we, we have to strive to be more beautiful. And, and, we have, and I will convince the business community that if we make it beautiful, if we care about those sorts of things, more people will come and business will be better. But I know people are terrified to lose a parking space, but we need to reconfigure it and we need to think about things in a, in a, in a broader way. Brought up this whole story of uh, bulkheads. So, on the City Dock bulkhead, I've said this maybe a dozen times, and hopefully it's the last time I have to explain it. When we rebuilt that bulkhead, we rebuilt it not only on schedule with a million dollars on our budget. That million dollars is going to be used for other things in the city. Why did we build it that way? When I came into office, I said, How does this project affect sea level rise and climate change? And their answer was, It doesn't. I said, Well, you have to change the plans. They said, No. This goes back to a grant that was under a previous mayor, and you have to use the money for exactly what it was designed for. If you change it, you'll lose all that funding. So could I have lost the seven, all the funding for it and do it again? Probably could have, but the dock could have collapsed at that point. So I do want to make it better, and we are installing backflow preventers. We have a plan. Not just on that, I went door to door and talked to businesses. We're applying for a $3 million federal grant. Because you know, people say it floods and hurts business. But how much does it hurt their business? We're getting those numbers on a day-to-day -day basis when it floods and when it doesn't to go forward. I got a $5 million ask to the legislature this year. We're partnering with the Naval Academy on it. We do have a plan to address it. We just have to find the funding going forward. You're good? All right. Well, next question goes to you anyway, so, yeah. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Ga Mr. Buckley. Okay. While you do not have any history to judge your political promises, you have floated some of your own over the course of the campaign. Notably, these have been about increasing mobility in the city, efficiencies in the process of working with the city, and increasing the desire for people to come to Annapolis. How do you think you're going to fare on these promises? I think no problems. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't, you know, in the business world, um, and I'm not saying I'm some expert business owner, I'm learning as I go along, I'm learning about politics, you know, but in the business world you don't do things unless you have a way to pay for them. So everyone says, oh, Gavin has all these ideas, how is he going to get there? Well, I do look at them, and they're not going to get done until we find a source of funding. So you take things like the trolley idea. We can get a transit, we can get federal transportation funds to buy the plant and equipment. And then we treat that as a business. We make that a business that someone can run for two years. And the way that person gets paid is through a tip system. I've talked to the um, electric cab drivers and talk about the money that they make. They, they can make from $50 to $500 a day in the old system when they were working on tips. So this tip system that I talk about is, it's in an, uh, a, a trolley, it's an articulated one, so we can take one section off when it's not being used and then put the section back on the weekends. It has a long clear tube, and that long clear tube is attached to a vacuum that's next to the driver. And when the people get on the trolley, and it's a fun trolley, they want to get on, it's part of the experience. And what's great about the trolley is it gets people out of their cars at the top of Main Street, next to the empty garages, and it gets, the different, gets them to different commercial zones. But they open up a little uh, gate in this clear tube, it's like you see in the bank. You put your dollar in, and the dollar flies to the front of the cab, and then the kid asks the dad for another dollar. And, this, and, then, 
And then that also the guy that's, and this is someone's business, and the guy that's driving that cab has a PA system, and he is telling people about St John's and Maryland Ave and Gate 3 as he's making his way down the street. Now on the Main Street idea, people think, oh, he's going to take a, lot, a row of parking away and ruin the city. First of all, I'm going to sit with the business community and say, look, I promise you, if you believe in this, it will be a good thing. And what we can do when we rebuild Main Street now is we can extend the sidewalk about a foot and a half. And if we could extend the right-hand side of Main Street sidewalk a foot and a half, we could actually create cafes from Treaty of Paris to Cafe Normandy to Joss to, to uh, Acme. And all those cafes would be on a curb and they would all have a view of the water. And that, those cafes would bring an extra $100,000 of revenue to those businesses. And it would sit people on Main Street looking at the water and create what I believe would be a real European kind of cafe culture on Main Street. It's just an idea. And, if we, and, if, and, if, and in two years, if everyone hated it, well, we would take it away and we put parking spaces there. But if you don't try anything, you don't ever know. So. Yeah. All the, the trolley eliminates all cars. No, it just, it it's just a long side car. It just gets people out of their cars at the top of Main Street. So if you sign people into the garages, the state garage is empty all weekend long, seven nights a week. The Whitmore garage is empty. My dream is people get out of their cars at the top of Main Street at the visitor center, and they actually walk down Main Street. Because I think in this day and age, the one thing we have in this town, and the one good news about an Amazon world, is that at Amazon, a person can press a button and the thing at the mall will be at their doorstep the next day. But we have a real Main Street, we have real history, we have real water, we have real people, real neighbours that are on that Main Street. So if you make your Main Street special and exciting, that is a value added to retail. And so we have to take advantage of that. So a lot of the things we heard, I believe he wants to do them. I believe he's passionate about them. I'm not questioning your sincerity at all. What I am going to say is that's unrealistic to do the things he says. There's not a way to pay for them. And I'd like to explain to you. If you look at transportation, right, we're going to get a federal grant to pay for it. The federal government does not give you grants to pay for 100% of it. The city still has to cough up money. With that being said, out of all the cities, pretty much in Maryland, across the country, you only get 35% of your money back from the fare box. Even Ocean City, which has the easiest and best transportation maybe in the country, one lane up, one lane back, they lose money and have to subsidize it. So when we talked about running a $5 million transit system, it, it blows my mind to say, well, we're just going to put a dollar in here and it's going to fly forward, and then a kid will put another dollar. I mean, think about that. We're going to raise $5 million off someone voluntarily putting up a dollar? That's not realistic. And if you look at the cost of a free trolley, a free boat system, a spray park downtown, a bike lane across Forest Drive, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars. And besides a tip system and federal grants which are drying up, I don't know how we honestly pay for it. public transport system being on a tip. I'm just talking about a trolley that goes from gate three to downtown and a trolley that goes from the stadium to the Eastport Bridge. That little fun trolley, that part of the experience, I'm talking about that being on a tip system. This is definitely not about that. That's a much bigger question. All right, well, let's uh, stop it there. I know we can go on with this for a while. Uh, we're gonna take uh, a little tip break. Right? Hello. That's fun so far, huh? <laughs> Day drinking makes everything a little more fun, right? So, who's got their cards and they want to have questions? Uh, John's right there, he's going to collect questions. We've got one right here. Who's got another card? We've got any two cards. We've got three cards right back there. So, just, just grab John and give him the cards. And so, here's what we've been doing. So, we're trying to keep this as nonpartisan as possible, just, you know, obviously. I mean, it's not going to take the offer of free gift cards to Metropolitan or someone waving all my parking tickets to sway us, right? Right? So, what we, so what we had, the cards we've collected so far from you folks, we've had on a board in the back, and as these gentlemen have answered the questions, we've taken the cards off because we weren't going to revisit what's already been asked. Uh, if people had multiple questions, then we stacked those cards, and those are the cards uh, that, because we're not going to ask the same question of each candidate, so it had to be individual uh, to each person. So if we don't get your card, we got we got cards from virtually everyone. So if we don't get your card, I'm sorry about that, but I'm not sorry. So I'm going to on to that. So uh, we're going to take a quick two-minute break, and this is a real two-minute break. It's not a city council two-minute break. 
So, uh, to go through the cards real quick. So, uh, finish up your drinks, smoke if you got them, and we'll be back in literally two minutes. Subscribe to our podcast, and at least once a week, because we have one show that downloads at noon, precisely noon, every Thursday. We have a show that's an hour long, and then we have what we call a crab case. Isn't that cute? Because they're not quite as long as a regular episode. They run between 25, 30 minutes, and whatever we want to do. And uh, John also has a daily briefing for the Ion Annapolis, which is every day around noon, and that's about a 10-minute news cap of the most important news stories of the day, which I actually listen to. I don't, I do because I listen to a lot of stuff. But, uh, what you mean? How are we, how are we looking? I want to be ignored, Dan. <laughs> Fatal attraction. <laughs> hey. Okay, great. And it's back to you, sir. Wonderful. Well, uh, we had uh, many, many questions submitted. And uh, what we have done is allowed uh, the candidates to blindly choose uh, the questions that the other candidate will address, but they didn't know what those questions are, so they couldn't make them particularly mean or anything else. All right, so uh, we will start with Mike, and uh, this is the first question uh, that Gavin picked for Mike. Newtown 20 residents are living in substandard conditions, mold problems, plumbing problems, problems with bats, crime, what are your plans to improve all of that? Mike. You're absolutely right. And if you look at public housing in Annapolis, Newtown may be one of the worst. The first thing you have to do before you fix a problem is know what the problem is. When the federal government does inspections, they don't really inspect the housing units. They do a random sampling. Maybe we'll take one here, one over there. They don't know what's happening in every unit. My administration changed that. So now we know what we have to do. We're going to work with the housing authority to make sure they can fix it. I told them they could use our lobbyists to help apply for more federal and state grants. We have to ask more, not just of ourselves, but other elected officials to get more funding. I think the program they're working on with RAD, Public-Private Partnership, will help take that forward. And I'm confident that we're going to be able to help fix these problems in the future. Bravo! Well, just like that, we're going to need more questions, John. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, well this is an easy one. Uh, this goes to Gavin. Uh, sanctuary cities, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I was doing really good at the editorial board uh, thing with John and um, uh, I thought I'm going to win the endorsement of the paper. And the last question was about sanctuary cities and it was like this. <laughs> so, so I'm an immigrant, uh, if you didn't know. Um, and so, <laughs> so I believe I believe in uh, the need for that, but I'm, it's also about timing. And so I'm not sure if I'm all in, but I believe down the road, I believe in the good things about sanctuary cities. The good things about sanctuary cities is that policemen can't choose people because of the colour of their skin. 
The good thing is that people should not be afraid of um, reporting a crime. So we need those tools to report crimes. And another thing, my kids go to public school, you know. So those kids go to school and they're afraid that they're going to come home and not see their parents. And so they live in fear ever since this subject has come up. So I believe in the process. I believe in what we voted on, um, the um, safe cities of the, we, that we voted on, um, the Non-Discrimination Act that Mike put forward and, and the city voted on. I believe in that. I think there's a time when we should make that decision. I'm not sure of it's now because uh, with a uh, president, the way we have uh, at the moment, I'm not sure if I want to make a target out of this city. goes two minutes per person and that's all I'm sorry uh, but you can't answer this question Mike uh, <laughs> panhandlers and homeless people are increasing in numbers <clears throat> particularly around church circle what are you going to do about that there's a lot of people struggling in this city everyone in this room right now they're going to go home probably drive their car lay in their bed at night and not have to worry about where they sleep that's not the reality for many people. We have a number of Title I schools. I believe 70% of people at uh, Germantown Elementary and Mills Parole are on free and reduced meals. There's a big problem out there. So one of the things we're doing is we're trying to work with our nonprofit sectors. Probably the biggest and best thing we've done is a lighthouse shelter. When you look at the work that they do, they don't give people a hand out, they give them a hand up. The city's partnered with them. We've donated money to their campaign and other groups to help people go forward. As far as panhandling goes, you know, part of what we do as a government is sometimes reactive, not proactive. You know, it's not Big Brother where there's someone on every corner every second. If someone calls our police department or if someone calls our inspections unit, they'll ask them to leave if they're playing music and disorderly. So we do have people out there, we ask them to move, but if someone comes back every day, that means someone's got to come out there every day. And we live in a free country and we can't just ban someone from coming downtown. But we'll make sure that our police and our inspectors are on top of it, moving them along. Because it is a distraction to quality of life and everyone's enjoyment. Thank you. All right, uh, Gavin, this is the one I'm sure you've been waiting for. <laughs> Why did you ignore proper filing properly filing <laughs> application for your building mural for the Annapolis Historic Preservation Commission? I love this question. <laughs> So um, it's pretty simple. Um, the rules have never been there for paint or paint colour. So we got a citation for peeling paint. We took it to our lawyer and we looked at the code. And the code, Historic Preservation Code, clearly states in emboldened letters, the Historic Preservation Commission does not have jurisdiction over paint or paint colour. So we saw that as an opportunity to, to do public art. We didn't avoid the process. We didn't believe there was a process. So I'm happy that people come and look at that mural and I'm happy if they hate it. I'm happy because I just want them to stop and look at something. I believe good public art is a necessary thing for this town. You, you don't have to be rich or poor to enjoy it. So we believe we didn't break the law, but after we went through the process with the city and we went to a judge who we thought would favor the municipality, and when the judge said, uh, you know, favour the municipality, we were respectful, we put in the application and we filed. But I really truly believe that um, I did not want the Historic Preservation to be in charge of artistic content and that's what would happen. You know, an arborist and a couple of architects and a, and a lawyer or whatever and know, know, know more about art, know, know more about art than any of us in this room. interesting one for, for Mike. Uh, some are concerned about your relationship with the national GOP, uh, shutting down Chief Baker, sanctuary cities. The bottom line is, do you support President Trump? <laughs> the big elephant in the room, so let's address this and I'll start with uh, sanctuary cities since it came up again. If you look at these other debates, and one of the great things about what we're doing here, we're talking, we're having a good time, but all these are televised. And in two previous debates, Gavin was asked if he supported it, and he said yes. So I'd like to talk to you about what sanctuaries are and what they're not. 
Sanctuary city is very simple. It mainly means one thing. If somebody commits a violent crime, class one felony and murder or rape, that the local jurisdiction, your police department, cannot cooperate with the federal government. I think that's a terrible thing to tie our police department's hands. What a sanctuary city is not. A sanctuary city doesn't mean that the police department can deport people. We never have, we never will. It doesn't mean that a kid's gonna lose in-state tuition. It doesn't mean they're gonna lose a driver's license. It doesn't mean any of the things people make it out to be. It's very simple if you look it up. Should our police department be able to work with the federal government in the case of a class one crime, number one. Number two, this election is about local issues. It's not about President Trump. It really isn't. You know, when you look at the issues that happen in this city. I know we got the Gavin crowd over there. I've done things. You know, you look at the last election, right? When they were doing presidential endorsements, I endorsed John Kasich because I thought he was modest, bipartisan, and would be good for the city. When Donald Trump does things that aren't good for the city, I talk out about it. I think everybody in this room, Democrat, Republican, thought it was terrible to defund the Chesapeake Bay. But the one thing I won't do is sit here and condemn and say, oh, we got to, I have to respond to every single tweet the president does. Because I'll tell you a fact, he's tweeted more in his first five months than I have in four years. So every time I get a response about, boy, what do you think about the president this? What do you think about the president that? It distracts away time from what we're doing the local issue. Yeah. I would have made our fire department. I would have on our police department to keep giving them the tools they need. So if you look at my administration, whether it's Trump, Barack Obama, you never really hear me talk about them. why it's not important to the day-to-day -day issues of your quality of life. Thank you. All right, um, Gavin, somebody has written to you and said that uh, Mayor Pantelides sent a mailer saying you wanted a Ferris wheel as we dog. Is that true or is it Whoa! I love this question. Because, uh, I'm flattered that Mike's created a website that says, see Gavin's Ferris wheel. <laughs> And I'm going to blame John and Tim for that question. So um, the way this, I'm on the record saying we need things for families to do when they get downtown. There is nothing to do when you get downtown. It can't just be t-shirt shops and bars. And so what do we do to get families downtown? I say we need things like city bike shares. We need a blade of grass at City Dock for God's sake. We need... Um, carousels, spray parks, these are ideas you see in other cities. And when the um, Ferris wheel idea came up, I was on Ion Annapolis, and I said to these guys, here's an idea for City Dock, what do you think of this? A Ferris wheel, and we call it I on Annapolis. <laughs> so I'm going to blame them, and it's based on the London Eye. So last time I checked, the Lon London was a pretty historic city. And not, this is just an idea. I'm going to have a lot of them, you know, if everyone just has a reaction to it. But I think we should be not making our city dock the biggest, the, the most pretty parking lot in America. It should be other things than just parking lot. SB Plus, the entity which deals with parking, right, uh, is doing a good job, the job you expected. I think they've done better. We're in a better spot now than we were four years ago. But I think we have a lot of work to do going forward. I think the fact that we can pay with parking on our cell phones is the right step forward. I think the fact that the city of Annapolis passed regu uh, <clears throat> got rid of rules to allow private people to open up parking, that's opening up probably close to 100 spaces is positive. I like the fact that a circulator is on an app, and I like their vision for the future, that you'll be able to find real-time data in the garages of how many spots that there are. I think that the fact that we put residential parking permits online is more efficient and is better for residents. But I think there's a lot of learning curves. They've hit a lot of stumbling blocks. Parking's a big issue in this town over the last 40 years, not just four years, and will continue to be. I think incrementally we're moving in the right direction going forward. And with the little bit of time I have left, and not to go back to the previous question, because on the Ferris wheel, when you listen to it, and that's why I did the website, you know, a lot of people said things like, 
my opponent said this, my opponent said that, and it's never backed up. So I said, I want you to watch the video link. I want you to hear the, read the transcript in his own words, because it wasn't just a joke. I mean, there was very specific details about, look, it's gonna be on a two year lease, here's how we're gonna fund it, it's gonna be a 50 by 20, and it was very detailed explanations of how this would happen. And so if that was a joke, I think we have to ask the question, is the carousel a joke? Is the spray park a joke? Is the ice park downtown a joke? Is the trolley a joke? I think we need to hear clearly which ones are joke and which ones aren't. They are all ideas, and everything's on the table. So I'm not going to say, um, but you know, if you don't have any ideas, if you don't try anything, and I'm happy that Mike's come up with one lately, the dog park. <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, on that note, uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh, now this one goes to Gavin, right? Uh, neither candidate addressed the gang problem with MS-13 reaching into our elementary, middle, and high schools to recruit, abduct, beat up, and kill our young people. What is your plan for dealing with the gang members? So obviously my kids go to public school and um, this is uh, an area that we're talking about. This isn't a private school thing. This is a, it's happening in public schools. And so we have to make it a priority to keep our kids occupied. We have to, what happens is the parents of some of these kids are working two jobs. They are not around to see what their kids are doing. So when we make things unaffordable, when we make a summer camp um, only affordable to a certain amount of people, when we defund a rec centre, when we don't have soccer fields for kids to play on or things for kids to do, they get into trouble. And it's not just MS-13, there's a lot of things that we should be looking at in this town. There's different types of gangs, different kids are getting hold of guns, kids, should, kids shouldn't be getting hold of guns, we should have strict gun control in this town, we should have strict gun control in public housing for illegal firearms, that should be... Um, a, 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 a one strike and you're out thing. And so we have to get to our kids um, at middle school. That is the crossroads. And I see my kid at middle school right now and I can see what happens. You can go one direction or the other. And so we are failing as a society and we can't just say, oh, well, it's the county, we can't do anything about it. Well, we feed the school. We, it's our kids, it's our future. And so that has to be a huge priority for us to make sure that we have things for the kids to do so they can't get into those gangs. Yes. Let's see, here's one from Mike. Uh, what are your plans for partnering with the county to make the safe stations inclusive as the initiative, I believe, started in Annapolis for this program? Tell us what that means. Sure. So one of the things we talked about earlier is demonizing people that have a mental health addiction. We have to change the mantra of just locking people up. One of the programs that the county started and the city followed on was safe stations, which means you can go to any fire department in the city of Annapolis or Anne Arundel County and ask for help. You can walk in there and say, I have an addiction, and maybe you have drugs on you. Can you give me help? No consequences. They don't arrest you. They connect you with mental health agencies going forward. We've done that. We've had, I think, 100, 150 people come by willing, and I think we need more of that. You know, more importantly, even though the city doesn't run many of the social services or mental health, we have to work with the county and the state and our other elected officials and ask for more. There's a big stigma around mental health, which is a major cause of addiction, and how are we going to deal with that going forward? So I think we've partnered with Anne Arundel County in a number of ways. We've partnered with them on transportation. We've partnered with them on getting boats out of Weems Creek. We've partnered with them um, on the election. We've partnered with a number of things. I think we need to continue to build that going forward and offering more people opportunity and hope saying, look, you're not just going to get arrested. There's going to be a second chance for you when you get outside. We're going to connect you with mental health agencies. It's the biggest issue we face. And Gavin's absolutely right. Absolutely right. When I was in one of my meetings, I was talking with people, and they were talking about how they engage kids, and they said, oh, yeah, we have this great program we're doing in middle school. And I said, kids are doing heroin in middle school? They said, yeah, by the time they're in high school, they're already gone. They said they're already gone. So I think getting engaged at a younger age is so important. And we're going to continue to do that in the future. Safe Station is just one of the things we've done, but there's more we're going to do in the future. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, 
Here's a uh, thought for you, and you can react to it, Gavin. My husband and I love Annapolis, but we can't afford an expensive house. So it makes it hard to see our future here without affordable housing in neighborhoods. We don't want to move, uh, so do you have any plans that would help young families like ours? Of course. Um, so the thing that happens in our town is I want, we're slowly becoming a city full of million dollar houses. And some of those million dollar houses people don't even live in, they're second homes. So I think we should incentivize development that creates a product that is accessible to young people. Maybe a studio type of development or smaller types of programs. We have a massive opportunity in some of the locations of public housing to do that thing that I talked about, the Uplands project. You could, there's enough room in these areas to create excess housing that could be for purchase. So the Uplands program that I talked about, the pro product was 120,000, 150,000, 220,000 the top end. And if you had people living in those areas and that kind of, the Uplands product that, um, project that I'm talking about, it's a five year old project. Only one person has dropped out of that project in five years. So we need to incentivize development. We need to make sure that this town doesn't become a, a town full of million dollar houses. I want young people to be able to afford to live here. I want my kids to buy a house here one day. And I want those kids to start businesses in this town because we need that energy. We need that fearless energy that comes with making a city for younger people and looking into the future. Thank you. All right, we're almost at the end. Um, closing statements will be soon, but not quite yet. Um, we have like one final question. So we'll ask uh, Gavin first, uh, what do you think is the most significant accomplishment of uh, Mayor Pantelini's? I think he did a great job on snow removal last year. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Mike, I think, um, I think you, you're getting a lot of, there's things that are getting done on your watch. I definitely I give you credit for that. I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican, as long as you're getting things done. So, and I would say, I'd say, I would say, um, uh, the appointment of Beverly um, as the hacker um, president, I think that was a great decision because I've drunk the Kool-Aid and when I talk to her, she talks about her need to want to fix it. And so I love that passion, and I think that um, she can get the job done. And so I think that was a, um, a great appointment, and, uh, and I hope they keep her on there, and I hope she moves forward, and they don't, she just doesn't want to do one year. She gets the job done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll flip it around. Uh, Mike, uh, what do you think is Gavin's greatest contribution to the city of Minneapolis? First of all, I have to say thank you. I'm glad we actually ask these questions and debates because it keeps it friendly instead of always going after each other. I think there's, I'm going to say more than one. There's a lot of things you've done, Gavin, to help this town. I think one of the, I think one of the main things you did was help revitalize West Street. You know, when you look at Lemongrass, when you look at Tsunami, when you look at Metropolitan, the city of Annapolis is better because those restaurants are there. I think you have a passion and a lot of ideas. You know, dining under the stars. I remember people came to city council and said, don't vote for it, it's gonna shut down traffic. And I said, look, kind of to your point, we're gonna try it if it works, it'll work. If it doesn't, it won't. So I think you bring a lot of energy and fresh ideas to the debate. And you know, regardless of whatever happens, whoever wins, I hope we can work together. starts with his opening state, uh, closing statement and we'll follow up with Mike's. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming here on a Sunday. I'm glad they provide an alcohol. Makes it a little easier. <laughs> so um, when I first came to this town, um, I sailed in here in a beat up old boat with a couple of hundred dollars in my pocket and I got a job as a waiter at Middleton's Tavern. And behind Middleton's Tavern there was an empty shop and it had been vacant for a year and I pitched the first coffee shop to this town. And while I was uh, saving my tips and throwing it into that coffee shop and fixing up the space, my girlfriend at the time, who is my wife right now, um, who is doing everything to make this happen, it's incredible when you have a partner that can do, carry the load for you while she's pretty much a single parent. She gave me a little card, and that little card was an Oscar Wilde quote, and the quote said, yes, I'm a dreamer, for a dreamer can make his way by moonlight and see the dawn before the rest of the world. 
So this feels like a dream for me um, to actually get a chance to run against Mike, to run for office for one of the oldest countries, uh, capital cities in the in the country. And so I feel privileged to actually even be up here. I feel like a success story from my first um, my first lawn sign or my first bumper sticker was amazing. So so what I want to do is I want to focus on three things. I want to focus on the economy. I want to focus on uh, the environment. I don't want to focus on um, the community. And so on the economy, I have a record to run on. We came to West Street where people didn't think anything could work. They thought you'd be out of business in a year. Why would you invest in that street? We invested in that street because it was, it was diverse. It was different. It had some edge. And we made things happen. We made Tsunami happen. We made Metropolitan happen. We did a fashion store and gift shop. We did a, uh, a lemongrass. We did... Um, a salon, Hudson Foucault, we did businesses that brought energy to that street. We drove arts agendas. We really so West Street's come a long way. And now I want to do that for the whole city. So you know what the solution to crime is? A job. You've got to give people jobs because kids have got to have hope. And I'm a job creator. And I can take empty spaces and turn them around. I don't have all the answers, but I'll find the people that have the answers. And I'll go to the cities. Well, this is a I'll go to the cities and get those, um, get those answers and get those ideas and look at best practices in other places and bring this back, things back to this town and make them happen. I didn't realise there was only three minutes there. <laughs> on the environment, we should, be, we should be leading the way on green initiatives. We should be a no discharge zone in Spa Creek and Weems Creek and Back Creek. That should be a priority. It sends a message about who you are. It's our kids play in that water. We fish from that water. I, I'm a restaurateur. I want people to say, that's delicious. It came out of the Chesapeake Bay. So we should be leading the way on green initiatives. On community, there's no secret that there's two Annapolis's, the haves and the have-nots. That has to be our highest priority, to get people together, to bring people together, to make everybody feel welcome in this town. That has been West Street's success. West Street has been successful because it was inclusive. Tsunami was the first restaurant to have a gay night in this city. We are, you can run into your parents at our restaurant, so we, we are age inclusive. And, we, and racially, we are the most mix of any of the of, um, of venues in the city. And so we need to work on that and we need to bring people together. We need to build community. I'm the guy to get the job done. With your help, I'll get elected and uh, we'll take this town forward. The thing is, you can't get stuck in the past. We have to celebrate history, but you can't get stuck in it. So I'm going to take the town forward with new ideas. I'm going to try some new things. With your help, I'm going to reach out to you and ask you for ideas and, and, and involve those ideas. I'm going to build community where people want to volunteer for, for uh, groups. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to bring the love back. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming out. I know everyone has a busy schedule, especially on a Sunday. Taking the time to get involved in local politics is so important. I want to thank Gavin for running. You know, one of the challenges we have in this city is we don't have enough people running for office. There's automatic races that have been uncontested for years. I want to share with you my vision for the future. We've talked a lot about our accomplishments over the past. We've talked about the fact that we haven't raised a tax rate in four years. I'd like to continue that in the future. I've talked about my open door sessions, the first Tuesday of the month. Anyone can come in and talk to me. That's where some of my best ideas come from. I want to continue that in the future. We've talked about our transportation system. How do we move people around this city? How we've improved it, and we're going to make it even better in the future through partnership. Some of the biggest legacy things I want to leave behind is on the housing authority. It will not get changed overnight. But if you look at the work that we've done, and it's not about you or me or the fact that they're losing money, it's about people. It's about the children living in those conditions and that neighborhood. We have to do more to make their life better. I'm committed to continue to work with them. I have regular meetings on them. I'm going to push our federal and state official, official to do more for them. We're going to have a great police department in there, and we're going to give them more jobs and opportunity. We talked a little bit about the job fairs in the past. The economy is so important to people. We're going to work with our maritime industry to make sure they can find people. We're going to promote the solar energy park. You know, that's just one thing we've done. We took an old city landfill, which was literally a pile of trash. We leased it to a private developer. 
We're putting up 55,000 solar panels. It's going to make the city $20 million over the next four years. Bold, innovative solutions taking us forward. When we talk about what else can we do to make our city better, there's a lot of things we can do. And it comes from people out here in the community working together in partnerships. I talk about the environment and give the endorsement of the League of Conservation voters. But I can't do it alone or they can't do it alone. It's about connecting everyone. And I'm proud to say we had our first church be green certified in the city. We had our first senior living facility get certified in there. It's going to be the residents, the business community, everybody working together to make sure we have a clean and green environment going forward. I also have a passion about technology. How can we make things better? You've heard some of it with the apps and everything else. Um, but there's a number of things we can do. Drone technology is huge. When there was an accident on Forest Drive, on average it took us three hours to clear it. Now with drones we can clear it within an hour. They fly up, take photos, and move on. I got elected because people wanted something different. And I think that's what I've offered over the last four years. Bold and innovative solutions working with the community. And that's what we're going to do in the future. So if you had to sum up what are the big things we're doing in the future, number one, we're going to keep making our police and fire department number one and reaching out for people. Number two, we're going to work on the environment, making sure we have the best environment. Because it's not about us. None of us are going to be here 100 years. It's about our kids and the legacy we leave them. Number three, we're going to transform the housing authority. <coughs> Anybody who knows me knows one thing. I refuse to quit and give up. Number four, we're going to work with our business community. Planning and zoning will be better. And I'm counting on all of you to help. We have a number of boards and commissions that are open and have vacancies on. Please volunteer to serve. You know, this is my dream to be mayor of my hometown. And every single day I wake up and I work hard to make the city better. And I got to say, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the vote of confidence people gave me four years ago and for my amazing campaign staff and family. There's a lot of people that work hard to get me here, that help me through the process. And to all of them and all of you, I want to say thank you and God bless. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Mayor Panelides. Thank you, Gavin Buckley. Thank you to the Ramshead. Please make sure you tip these servers really well. They're up to their top three on a Sunday morning. I want to thank Ray back there for handling our video, Teresa and Kathy for doing our timing. Uh, certainly the 300 or so of you out here, the people that are watching on Facebook for coming out and spending part of your Sunday with us. Elections are very important, and we all need to cast the right vote for ourselves, so be informed. At both Ion Annapolis and the Maryland Crabs, we've been all over the election. So before November 7th, go back, check them out, see the interviews that we did with all of the aldermen and all of the mayor candidates, and make sure that you vote on September 7th. It is so critically important. Um, and finally, for some self, purely selfish self-promotion, make sure you do check out ionannapolis.net as well as the MarylandCrabs.com. Um, we got a lot of fun stuff going on there. Give the podcasts a listen. All the links are in your program, so make sure you take your programs home and share them with your friends. But before we go, I'd like the two candidates to come up front, in front of the table, please, and bring your cell phones. <laughs> and Tim, if you could stand behind there to make sure that they're a little bit, uh, little bit honest here. Now we all know that music is critical to how you folks vote, right? All right, so together I want you guys. Wait, wait, wait! We gotta get the phone from mom here. Let's go get it. <laughs> you guys are panicked, so I just want to let you know we're not checking your pictures. Yeah, we're not going to the pictures here, okay? But music is absolutely critical there. So I want you to open up iTunes or Apple Music. Go ahead, push the button, Gavin. You're probably like one of those Android guys, aren't you? All right, go to your scroll to your playlist. And there should be a sub playlist said the 25 most played songs. And Buckley says his kids use his phone. Not likely. I use Pandora. Now I'm going to bet on Tiesto for Mike. <laughs> now, if Josh Cohen was here, I'd go with Katrina and the Waves. That's the <laughs> oh, I see. You went to the wrong one there. Oh, no. Oh, gotcha. Come on out there, boy. Figure it out. Uh, Playlists. Uh, Scroll down. 
just, you know, just go back. All right, all right. All right, well, we're going to go here with Gavin Buckley, and, and, and Mike will tell us his, his most played song, but Gavin Buckley official is Reptilla by The Strokes. Is that right, Reptilla or Reptilla? Something like that. And what would, what would you say? I got a little bit of sweet lead on here. Uh, Mike is okay. Mike is going with local band Sweet Lita. Wow. Hey, that, that's all you need to vote, but do make sure you get out on November seventh. And I do want to give a special thank you to Seth, who's back there in the booth. There, I don't know whether he has any strokes back there that he can take us out with, or maybe some reptilla. No, I'm not gonna do thrift shop. You can't change it now. So, all right, take care, guys. Mr. Mayor. Most importantly, can we have another hand, a round of applause for Dr. Dan Nataf, who came all the way.